Hello, and welcome to Lesson 2 in our study on the ecumenical movement. When we finished the last lesson, we were talking about how the goal of the ecumenical movement is to get all people to unite together as one, to come together, to set aside our doctrinal differences, our theological differences, and focus on the common good of mankind and to unite ourselves together as one. We said we would pick up at this lesson with how are they trying to accomplish that? How do they get people to come on board with that? And, and put up a standard that people can say, that's reasonable and I can accept that. That's where we want to start with uh, in this lesson. So number one, what they do is they simply change the rules. Uh, they change the rules of what it is to be a Christian. They change the rules of who is a Christian. They redefine who and what is a child of God. Who and what is a Christian. And then, secondly, they redefine who and how someone gets into heaven or how someone gets to God. They take and make up their own standard and they make it in such a way that people can jump on board with it. Let's kind of break that down, all right? So, number one, redefine who is a Christian. So, according to the ecumenical movement, the people in the ecumenical movement, it's a movement made up of people, I keep referring to it as an it, but the people that are in the ecumenical movement, they redefine who is a Christian. And the definition is, if you say you believe in Jesus, and I say I believe in Jesus, we're Christians. That's pretty much basically it. It doesn't get too much more into detail. So now, if you're a Christian and I'm a Christian, you see the progression here? Then we're brothers and sisters in Christ. And if we're brothers and sisters in Christ, we're both Christians, then as Jesus prayed, we should be united. You see the false foundation that's laid? Just say you believe in Jesus. And then when you do that, boom, you're a Christian. And if you're a Christian, you're my brother and sister, brother or sister in Christ. And if we're brothers and sisters in Christ, well, doesn't Jesus say we're supposed to be united? So therefore, if we're not united, you're disobeying Jesus' prayer and what it says in the Word of God. You're the one that's wrong. You have the problem. But it's all built on a false foundation. Who is a true Christian? If you acknowledge Jesus Christ. Well, acknowledge what? They don't really get into that. Some will say that Jesus Christ is Savior. But then you have to get into, well, how is he Savior? See, there's a multitude of different ways that Jesus believes. I mean, the people believe that Jesus Christ is your Savior. There's a lot of people that believe, and we'll get into that in a moment, that, yeah, Jesus Christ is Savior, he died on the cross, but I have to work for my salvation. Does that make them a true Christian? We're going to look at that and break that down, but you see, you get into all of these variations. My point is, scripturally, simply saying that you believe, and, the, and a lot of people are using the word believe as to intellectually acknowledge that something exists. And there are a lot of people that just intellectually acknowledge as a matter of fact that Jesus Christ was a real person. And so you say to them, do you believe in Jesus Christ? Well, yeah. And they're acknowledging that he was a person that lived in history. Well, that's not what the scripture talks about believing in Jesus Christ. When the scripture talks about believing, the word actually believe there means to trust, to place confidence in. It doesn't mean intellectually acknowledge that someone exists. The demons intellectually acknowledge that Jesus Christ exists. They know who he is and they know that he's the son of God. The scripture says the, the, the demons believe and tremble. They're not saved. They're not delivered from their e eternal punishment simply because they acknowledge. They're not putting their faith and trust in Jesus Christ for redemption. Because they can't. Redemption isn't open to them. But you see the difference in what the word believe? So they've, they've taken the word believe with a big brush and just got believe. You know, if you just say the word believe, whoop, there goes that big umbrella and everybody's in underneath it. That's the false foundation. And when you come under that false foundation, then all of the calls for unity out the window. That's what you've got to catch here with the ecumenical movement. They use this broad brush and say, well, if you just acknowledge, then you're my, you're my brother and sister. Boom, you're under, the, you're under the call for unity. The call for unity is for true born-again believers in Jesus Christ, not just for people. 
who claim to be believers. Now, is that what the ecumenical movement was really saying and what they believe, that as long as you acknowledge Jesus Christ? Well, listen to these quotes. November 30th, 2015, Pope Francis is speaking in, central, in the Central African Republic. Pope Francis, quote, Christians and Muslims are brothers and sisters. Did you hear that? Yeah. Let me say that one again. Christians and Muslims are brothers and sisters. We must therefore consider ourselves and conduct ourselves as such. So the Pope, the leader of the Roman Catholic Church, the one who professes to be the head of the one true church, says that Christians and Muslims we should consider ourselves and act as accordingly that we are brothers and sisters. Where does he get that from? Where does that come from? And, and, and I'm not putting this up so much to say, okay, let's argue with the Pope, but I'm trying to show you this is what the thinking is of the ecumenical church. And the Pope is really the focal point, the spearhead of what's going on in the ecumenical church. Am I going to say everything that he says, everyone in the ecumenical movement be believes and endorses? I don't know. I can't go that far. I can't climb inside everyone's head. But the general thrust of it, the general viewpoint there is there. Because if you follow all of their definitions, this is the logical conclusion. Does a Muslim believe in Jesus? Yeah. We're going to look at it in a little bit. What is it that they believe, though? See, this is where, keep this idea of believe and what does believe mean. You've got to keep that in the, in the back of your head as we go through all of these things here. Now, what's the scriptural answer? Not everyone who claims to be a Christian is a Christian. Remember again, I'm going to keep repeating it. The call for unity that Jesus gave in John chapter 17 is a call for unity among all true Christians. Not the world's view or definition of a Christian, but God's definition of a Christian. That's where the call for unity is. The call for unity in the ecumenical church is for anyone who names the name Jesus, and therefore you're a Christian. Now, the scripture teaches, again, let me get back where I was, that not everyone who claims to be a Christian is a Christian. Matthew 7, 21 through 23. A very powerful and devastating verse. Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Jesus speaking here. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, someone who says unto him, Lord, Lord, is acknowledging Jesus, saying that, saying that Jesus is Lord. In the ecumenical church, that would make you a Christian and a brother and sister. Jesus said, not Tarsitano, Jesus not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Listen now. Many will say to me in that day, judgment day, Lord, Lord, they're talking to him as Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? And in your name we've cast out demons. And in your name done many wonderful works. So what do you have here? You have people who are saying Jesus is Lord. They've given prophecies in his name. They've cast out demons in his name. And in his name, in the name of Jesus, you know, you see the televangelist, in the name of Jesus, they've done not only just wonderful works, many wonderful works. These are their words. This is what they're saying. We've done all of these things. And what does Jesus say to them? And then I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. I never knew you. Not once you were saved, but you really messed up, you did something wrong, and now you lost it. I never knew you, which means you were never truly one of mine. You talked about me, you used my name, you did works. You look like you cast out demons. That was probably Satan himself helping you to do it so that he would give a false impression to everyone around you. Satan can appear as an angel of light. 
and seem to do good things when it's all its purpose is deception. You've done all of these things, but you know what? You didn't really do them in my name, and you didn't do them in my power, and you're not really one of my children. You know why? I never knew you. And then on top of it, depart from me. He's sending them off to hell. They're lost. Eternal damnation. God, get out of here is what he's saying. Leave me. Out of my presence. That's a devastating thing. That is a devastating, and that completely, totally contradicts the definition that the ecumenical church puts on on who was a Christian. These people certainly named the name of Jesus, but they weren't Christians. Let's go a little further. Christianity is not defined, which this verse shows, simply by saying, I believe in Jesus. Mormons, they believe in Jesus. They say that they believe in Jesus. But what do they believe about Jesus? They believe that Jesus is the brother of Lucifer before he fell, which now makes him the brother of Satan. They wouldn't say he's the brother of Satan, but they say before Satan fell, when he was Lucifer, before he sinned, Jesus was his brother. Is that the biblical definition of Jesus? It absolutely is not, and that would make them not meet the biblical criteria to be a Christian. To be a true, Bible-believing, born-again Christian. But if you ask them, do they believe in Jesus, they would say yes. Jehovah's Witnesses, they believe in Jesus. If you ask them, do you believe in Jesus? Yeah, I believe in Jesus. What do you believe? We believe that Jesus is Michael the Archangel. Is that the biblical Jesus? Is that the scriptural Jesus? Is that who Jesus really is? They don't believe he's the Son of God. They don't believe that salvation is, is solely through faith in Jesus Christ. They're out there working for their salvation, trying to earn their salvation. So that, do they believe in Jesus? Yeah. According to the ecumenical, ecumenicalist definition, you're my brother and sister in Christ. Muslims. We read the quote where the Muslims are our brothers and sisters and we should consider them accordingly. Do Muslims believe in Jesus Christ? Sure. They believe in him. They believe that he exists. They believe he's a prophet of God. But that's it. He's one of the prophets of God. He's not the prophet of God. He's a prophet of God. And he's not really the highest prophet of God because that's for them, is reserved for Muhammad. Muhammad is the prophet of God. That's the prophet of God that they follow. Muhammad, who wrote the Quran. So you see, are all of these, according to the scriptures, they're not. True Christianity... Let me go through this quickly. True Christianity is properly defined by what is called the fundamentals of the faith. That's where the word fundamentalists come from, which the world has done a lot to turn into almost a curse word. But the fundamentals of the faith are non-negotiables. They're not areas of theology or areas of doctrine that we can negotiate away or that we can minimize or that we can say, well, not everyone needs to believe in this in order to be a true Christian. Yes, you do. Scripturally, yes, you do. Here's the fundamentals of the faith that in order to be a true Bible-believing Christian, a true born-again Christian, you need to believe these. These are non-negotiable. Number one, there's only one God. I'm not going to real. I'll give you scripture for them. I'm not going to explain all the way through all of them. No. Number one, there's only one God. There's not many gods. There's not multiple gods. There's not 15 gods. There's no uh, pantheism kind of thing, and polytheism. And there's one God. Isaiah, Exodus. I'm sorry. Exodus 20 verse 3. Isaiah 43:10. Secondly, the Godhead is a Trinity. The Trinity: Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Not three separate gods. Like, here's a God, and here's a... It's all... And again, the Trinity, we're going to explain that in five minutes now. But there's, there's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They're all equally God, but they make up one God. Because the Bible definitely clears there's one God. That's the Godhead, but they're all equally God. That's 2 Corinthians 13, 14. 2 Corinthians 13, 14. Third, non-negotiable, the incarnation of Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ is both God and man. He's God in the flesh. John 1.1, 1, 1, Colossians 2.9, 1 John 4, 1 through 4. That Jesus Christ, when he came here, through the took on bodily form, he was equally God and equally man. Fourth non-negotiable is the virgin birth. Jesus was born of a virgin, Matthew 1, verse 25. That is critical because 
in, in God's economy, the way God has set things up, sin, the sin nature is passed on through the man. In Adam, all have sinned. It's not passed on through the woman. So that's why the virgin birth was necessary, because if Jesus was born with an earthly father, he would have had a sin nature. And he would have been guilty of sin himself. And then he could not have been our savior. That's why he had to be born sinless. You know, he's God, and the human flesh that he took on had to be sinless. Otherwise, he'd be guilty of sin, and he couldn't be our Savior. It's a non-essential. Number five, salvation is by grace through faith alone. It's the key word. Salvation is by grace through faith alone. You are not saved by works. Works is a legitimate fruit of salvation. Works is a legitimate result of salvation, but works does not cause your salvation. Works does not earn your salvation. Works does not cause you to merit any part of your salvation. You are saved by grace through faith, and that's it, nothing else. Works come in as a result of already being saved. That's one of the big differences with the Catholic Church. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, and Galatians 5, 1 through 4. And then the last one, the only true gospel, the only true gospel that can be preached is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Without the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you have no Christianity. You have no true Christianity. Without salvation by faith... By grace, through faith alone, you have no true Christianity because you're not believing in Jesus Christ as the true Savior. Without the virgin birth, Jesus Christ cannot be our Savior. You do not have true biblical Christianity. Without the incarnation, without Jesus Christ being equally God and man, there is no salvation. Our sins are not paid for. Therefore, you have no true Christianity. Without believing that God is the one and only true God and truly believing who God the Father is and who Jesus Christ is and who the Holy Spirit is, you cannot have true biblical Christianity. You can't be a true Christian. So if you deviate from any of those, you may call yourself a Christian. The world may call you a Christian. The ecumenical movement may call you a Christian. But you're not a biblical Christian. You're not a true Christian. And that's where the difference comes. So that's why it says, how do they get people to be on board? You change the rules. You change the definition of who and what a true Christian is. Now, if you start to look at some of this, are any of these essentials being violated by the ecumenical movement? Well, let's give you a couple examples. And one of the biggest one is Roman Catholicism. Roman Catholicism violates number five. Salvation is by grace through faith alone. They don't believe that. that they, they believe that salvation is by grace, through faith, and works. Now, before you Roman Catholics start jumping up and down, that is exactly what the Roman Catholic Church believes, and they have not changed that teaching. That dogma is still in place. As we go on, you're going to look and see how some of the people in the Catholic Church, Tony Palmer, the one that we're going to look at with the video, it's trying to make it sound like, no, 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 the Catholic Church has changed its position. They took the word, they added the word alone in there. It's by, and you know, it's not really works, it's just, no, let me tell you something. That's exactly what they believe, they've always believed it, and they still believe it. Let me give you an example, rather than just my words. The Catechism of the Catholic Church, quoting paragraph 2068, so that all men may attain salvation through faith, baptism and the observance of the commandments how do you obtain salvation this is the words of the catholic church catholic dogma catechism of the catholic church all men may attain get you're going to get it how do you get that salvation through faith baptism and the observance of the ten commandments that's works that's faith but that's works council of trent justification Canon 9. This is official, infallible dogma of the church that has not changed. It is still in existence today as I make this tape. If anyone says, quoting now, if anyone says that by faith alone the impious is justified, 
If anyone says that by faith alone, that means apart from works, the impious is justified in such wise as to mean that nothing else is required to cooperate in order to obtain the grace of justification and that it is not in any way necessary that he be prepared and disposed by the movement of his own will, let him be anathema. That means a curse is put upon you. So they're saying, if you're saying that it's faith alone and nothing else is required to attain or to obtain your salvation, not to have it and keep it, or not to have it and show that it's real, which is what the true Christian would preach, that works as an evidence that your salvation is real. They're saying no to get it. That's what obtain and attain means. And they're saying, Council of Trent, if you're saying that you obtain it, you get your salvation just by faith and grace alone, a curse is put upon you, an anathema. And right now, today, I'm repeating myself, that anathema is still in place. This is still official today. So, Catholic Church gets moved out as far as the, as far as the scriptures are concerned. That's a big statement, but that's exactly what's said there. Secondly, let's look at the Muslims. We'll look at, we'll, we'll, we'll look at two, two of the bigger ones, because the Catholic Church said Muslims are our brothers and sisters. So is a Muslim our brother or sister in the Lord, as Pope Francis said? Is he really our brother and sister? Does he qualify? I don't know if, I don't know if he'd use the word Christian, but he's calling them brothers and sisters, are they? Well, let's look at what the Muslim says. Number one, the Muslims deny the deity of Jesus Christ. They say he's not God. In the Quran, Surah 1935. 1935. It is not befitting to Allah that he should beget a son. So they're saying right there, Allah, God, did not have a son. He didn't beget a son. It's, it's beneath him. It's not befitting for him. So therefore, Jesus Christ is not a son. Surah 18, verses 4 through 5. Surah 18, verses 4 through 5. Allah has begotten a son. Question. Allah has begotten a son. No knowledge had they of such a thing, nor had their fathers. It is a grievous thing that issues from their mouth as a saying. What they say is nothing but falsehood. So if you say that Allah had has a son, it would be Jesus Christ, that is a lie, it is a falsehood, it's not true. They deny the deity of Jesus Christ. So how can they be my brother or sister? Secondly, they deny the crucifixion of Christ. He didn't die on the cross. Surah 4, verses 156 through 159. That they rejected faith, that they uttered against Mary a grave false charge. That they said, we killed Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah. But they killed him not, nor crucified him. But so it was made to appear to them. And those who differ therein are full of doubts, with no certain knowledge. But only conjunction, I wonder if they meant conjecture there, to follow. For of a surety they killed him not. And on the day of judgment, he, speaking of Jesus, will be a witness against the Christians. So they deny that Jesus Christ died on the cross. They deny that Jesus Christ is God. Hello? And yet they're Christians? They're my brothers and sisters? They're my brothers and sisters, and we should consider them and treat them as that. How can the Pope make such a statement? How can he go out there and say such a thing? They deny the very foundations of the Christian faith. They deny the very foundations of what a Roman Catholic believes. A Roman Catholic certainly believes that Jesus is deity, that Jesus is the Son of God, and a Roman Catholic certainly believes that Jesus Christ was crucified. We're not even talking about works and salvation. The Roman Catholics believe those two things very strongly. And yet the Muslim denies that, and Pope Francis says there are brothers and sisters. Has the Pope become a law unto himself? How does he make these proclamations? He's supposed to be the leader of the church. He's supposed to think before he talks. How can he? Because this is the ecumenical movement and process. Let's all get together under the same umbrella. 
but it really makes you scratch your head and say, how far is this guy going to go? What in the world else is he going to say? Well, we're going to show you some more things uh, that he has said. You know me, if you've watched any of my other videos. You know I used to be Roman Catholic. You know I've done a lot of videos on Roman Catholicism. But I look at something like this, and I, and, and I say to Roman Catholics, how far are you going to go to defend this man? I mean, to make statements like this. I mean, that contradicts his own doctrinal beliefs. What, are we going to have 14 people come out and try to unwind and unspin what he said and say, no, he really meant this and he really meant that? I think he knew exactly what he meant, and he knew exactly what he was saying. This is how we prepare our minds to forget the doctrinal differences and all come under unity. The foundation for unity that the ecumenical people, they're trying to build it, but you can see it's broken. It's broken in the sense that I should say the foundation for biblical unity is broken here because these people are not true Christians. So, redefine who is a Christian. Secondly, redefine who are the children of God. Who are God's children? Listen to this. I'm looking at this and I'm looking at the clock. I'm almost on 30 minutes. I try to keep him at 30. I really don't want to race through this, so let me stop here, and we'll pick up on the next one of redefining who are children of God. We're going to give Roman Catholics and official documents how they have defined who are children of God, and then we're going to look at the Scriptures. Thank you for watching. Again, I, I, I hope that you encourage you to continue on watching these lessons. May the Lord bless you.